So I got my uh, my bridge finished and uh, <laughs> it was a fun project because what I really like about that one is there's there's no moving parts now that it's done. Not a lot can go wrong with it. And it was a fun project and it's given me great access to the cabin, particularly in the spring. And anyway, I'm on to the next project and uh, I've mentioned this a number of times, but I love old tools and I'm not sure the vintage of this one, but I scour flea markets, antique shops for usable tools and often they're wore out. They're they're pretty pooched, but this one um, has been taken care of, perhaps not seen a lot of use, and I'm in the process of trying to restore it. So, uh, yeah, I've got one side done here, and well, I've just, I'm just finishing burnishing it now, so that's the side finished, and uh, that took me about mm, four hours of labor, <laughs> but my labor is relatively cheap, and there's a side I haven't started yet, so yeah. Another four hours on that side, and then then we're on to uh, to sharpening it. The other thing I did was I made a couple of, or I, not a couple. It only has one handle. I made a new handle for it. So the the old one was all cracked and, and pretty much pooched. Um, so I whittled a new one out of cherry here. I still got some smoothing to do on the inside, and I got to drill some holes, and and we'll mount that guy. We'll mount that guy, and once we get it sharpened, I'll have a, a reasonably good tool to uh, to buck firewood because I'm trying to do everything uh, as they did in the 1700s. So my my thinking now is all the firewood I burn in this cabin from here on in is going to be hand bucked, hand split. So that's where I'm at. So finish burnishing this side, and four more hours later, I'll be done the other. I've uh, finished uh, burnishing up the, the saw and uh, yeah, it came up pretty clean and it's in great shape. Um, I did have to do a little bit of straightening. It had a bit of a kink in it and I've pretty much got the new handle fastened here. Interesting thing about the tool, this tool that I'm using here, at the time um, we think of them today as screwdrivers, but uh, we make these little guys in our in our blacksmith shop, and they were called turn screws at that time. And the only type of fastener uh, at that time had a slot in it. They hadn't thought of other things. Anyway, pretty handy little tool, particularly for maintaining a, a flintlock musket. So I'm going to mount this guy in the vise here. So I haven't got around to uh, getting that rope done here for my lathe, but this lathe is going to work for a, a great... Uh, workbench today. So bef just before I get into um, the anatomy and how one sharpens a crosscut saw, uh, a wee bit of history about my family. So my grandpa Hannon immigrated to Canada in the mid to late uh, mid to late 1800s and he arrived at a place called North Bay which uh, Today is a city, uh, by American standards to the south, not very big, but huge by northern Ontario. It has about 53,000 people. But when my grandpa got off the train there that had just been built to that location, North Bay simply meant the North Bay of Lake Nipissing. It was basically a depot uh, as the roads and tracks were going further into the, into the forests. Uh, and he was a cook. <laughs> so, uh, so in the winter time, because winter is the time they did logging, uh, when the sap isn't running, trees cut easier. Uh, and prior to the 1880s, they used axes. These came into place, uh, or I should say into play about that time in the, in the late 1800s, and they sort of fell out of grace around 1930. So this, the vintage of this saw is somewhere in that era, probably closer to the end of it, given the design of it. But Grandpa was a cook, and so in the wintertime he, he cooked in what they called shanties. Um, so they, they had a cook shed and they had a bunkhouse, and the crews would work there in the wintertime 
it was the logging camps, and in the summertime, it was the railroad camps. And there are reports that, that the loggers of that day would pick a particular shanty to work from based on the reputation of the cook. So I, I don't know whether my grandpa was a good cook or a mediocre cook. I'm not sure whether the people, the loggers migrated towards his shanty or migrated away from it, but that old fella had a lot of good and interesting stories. Anyway, on to the anatomy of a crosscut saw. So here, here we go with the parts of the saw. So these are the cutting teeth. And there are, there's groups of four, followed by what's known as a gullet, followed by what's called a raker. So the purpose of these three particular things are the teeth cut the fiber, and they, they, they are set opposite. So you've got one goes this way, one goes that way. There are 58 on this particular saw. It's approximately four feet long, so it could be used. You could put a helper handle on the end, uh, and two people could use it, but it was typically used by one person. So cutting teeth separate the fiber. The fiber uh, is chiseled by the raker. The chips or curls of wood go down into the gullet, and they're carried out on the push mode that way, and they're carried out of the log or the cut, which we call a kerf, in that direction. So we like to polish them up in our process of sharpening this because it, it makes them pull out better. Also, the depth of the, the uh, kerf was determined by the length of the saw. So a six, a seven, an eight foot saw would have deeper gullets because it had to contain more wood. So we're gonna get around to the sharpening part now. So the tool I'm using here is called a jointer, and the purpose of it, well, it's a dual purpose tool. One is a depth gauge, which I'll demonstrate later, but essentially what it does, you put the file in, and with these two turn screws, you put a slight, it's probably not gonna be visible here, but you put a slight bend in the file that matches the curve of the saw. And once you've established that, and you've got it set, what we're gonna do is run this down the saw, the full length. We're gonna do that on both sides. At this point, I'm going to have to put my spectacles on because these old eyes, this is pretty fine work and uh, yeah, I need to see what I'm doing here. And if they weren't so scratched, I probably could. So what I've done with that jointer um, is I've, I've, I keep joining, going over it until I've got a, a flat spot on each of the cutting teeth and the rakers. And, and that tells me now that all the teeth, um, even with the radius, are at the same height. And at this point, I can start to sharpen. So I prefer to start with the rakers. So the rakers have to be um, about nine to 10 thousandths of an inch shorter than the cutting teeth. We don't want the, the rakers to actually cut wood. We want them simply to chisel out the fiber that the cutting teeth have cut. So we're gonna start by, by use, taking our file out of our jointer here. And we put the jointer on, which now is gonna work like a depth gauge. So if we have a closer look here, we can see how the, the rakers stick above or are at the same height, if you would. We want them down to this height. So the, the next step we're going to do, there's, there's two ways of doing it. One is to use a hammer, which we have too much, too much meat on the metal at this point to do it. And we're going to take and we're going to tap these guys outwards. And if we get a close look, you'll see how these kind of curve out so that when we're finished sharpening them, they essentially look like a wood chisel. And, and that's the function. That's what we want them to do. So there's, there's too much to take down for me to just hammer these over at this point. Yeah, there's way too much. So we're going to file this down. So by using this tool, and put it on the right way. 
we're going to bring those rakers down. So now we've got them down to the height we want them. Uh, I should point out too that those rakers serve two functions. One is to chisel the wood out, force it down into the gullet, carry it out the length of the saw. The second function they do is they establish how deep our cutting teeth are going to cut. So we're going to go down the, down the, um, the whole length, get them all at that height, and once they're at that height, we're going to bring them to a point. So when we're filing these, we, we want to bring this just to a point. We want to take this flat spot that I haven't touched on this side, and we're going to keep filing that down until it comes to that chisel-like point we've got there. Uh, another thing I should point out, these are the main gullets for removing the sawdust, but the rakers themselves have a small gullet here. And the reason for that is it, it allows us to do that tapping process that I showed you. So about every third or fourth sharpening, these are going to become pretty vertical because we've brought, we've brought this line down. They become more uh, vertical on this side. And we want that sort of sweeping motion to it. So about every third or fourth filing, we have to file that gullet down a little deeper in order to allow us to tap that back into that gentle curve to make the chisel. Okay, now we have a finished raker. And so it's the right height, it's the right shape, and it's sharp on both points. So that's finished. The next step is to clean this gullet out. We want, we want this pretty shiny in here. If it's, if it's cleaned up and not too pitted, it allows the sawdust to fall out easier when on the pull and push stroke. So you don't have to be too fancy here, but we want to clean them up a little bit. Okay, so we've sharpened uh, the raker, we've cleaned out the gullet. So the next thing would be to put set in the teeth. So every tooth is going to go in opposite direction. And this, this looks like it's got enough set in it. So I'm, I'm going to sharpen this up and try it before I put more set into it. But there are numerous tools. One's called a setting block, which is the best tool. Um, basically, it's a block that has the right angle on it. One sets the saw on it, and using a set hammer, puts a set in it. Another method is to simply put a heavy tool behind it. So this tooth goes this way and basically you offset it. So from the side of the blade, so this tooth's going that way, it's going to cut on that side of the curve and it should be about five thousandth of an inch or so from the surface of the saw blade itself, which would give it enough width of kerf, what you're looking for, the kerf is the cut in the wood so that the, the teeth, the blade itself doesn't bind in the wood as you're sawing it back and forth. So we're going to, we're going to sharpen this up and give it a try before I look at set because I think, I think it's going to be good. The top of this cutting tooth, so I'm going to cut the, I'm going to sharpen the teeth that go on this side of the saw first, all the way down. When I finish that, I'm going to turn the saw 180 degrees, and then I'm going to sharpen the ones that go out this way. Um, there's less uh, chatter with the file. So I've established that flat spot on the top using my jointer. So using a bastard file, what I want to do is sharpen this down until half that flat spot disappears on this side, and then finish it off by bringing that to a sharp point. So we'll see if we can get this guy tuned up here.
Okay, so we have a very sharp point on this particular tooth now. Sharp on both sides, so I'm going to avoid this one. It's going to get sharper when I turn it around, and I start on this tooth. This tooth just barely got touched, so it's not going to take as much as that one. And when we're finished, all these teeth will be the same height. They'll all be razor sharp, and the saw should cut. Okay, I have two teeth sharpened and uh, there's 58, so uh, my math is right. I got 56 more to go. There, there is a tool, another tool, which I don't own. And, and I think they're making them again today, but they're pretty hard to find. It's called a spider. And basically it runs down the side, which, which is a gauge for how much um, set you've put in the cutting teeth. Um, you can eyeball it, and if you have a proper setting block, you, you can get them pretty close. So, Now the very last step, assuming I had these all done, some people like to go along with their file along the back edge of that, of the, of the cutting teeth, and when they're sharpened on this side, along this side, and that takes off the little burr you've created when you've filed that. You're filing only in one direction. But I like to use a thing, the old timers call it tapping off. So once I've got it all done, all the teeth are sharpened, I go along and I basically just tap each point. And that'll knock off that tiny little curl of metal that's on the back side away from the direction that I'm filing. When it's all done, and this is going to be a few hours, so uh, we'll uh, try to demonstrate it and see if the thing actually works. done. So just a final note, for storage of, of saws, if uh, you wanted to hear language come out of a logger that would embarrass even someone in, from the Navy, it would be leaning the saw up against something. Because it would put a permanent memory into the blade of the saw, which would cause more friction as the, as the sawyer would cut it, uh, move it to and fro through the wood. So the two helper handles, um, Often for the for bucking wood solo, they'd put a, a second um, helper handle here, so you could have one hand on the handle that sort of guided it, and another one that gave you the force to cut it. So at night they would remove those, clean all the pitch and and um, tar off of the particular if they were cutting softwood, the mammoth pines that we we knew that existed back in the day, uh, and they would store them by hanging them on those two holes on pegs in the shanty. And they didn't like to use petroleum products for protection or rust. They'd use some sort of a, a fat, uh, rendered down bear fat was probably very common, commonly used to store them. And they'd hang them at night, um, mount the handles back in the morning if they needed them and go into the bush and work. Anyway, back at it.
I've got it completely sharpened now. It took me about an hour and a half on each side. And I got lots of nice, shiny, sharp looking points. But as my mother used to say, the proof is in the pudding, whether it cuts or not. The, um, as I mentioned at the onset of my sort of tutorial on sharpening one of these guys, um, I think it has enough set. So if, if it's not gonna cut, it, I'll have to go back and uh, get some more set put in it. But I got a chunk of green cedar up here, and if it cuts through this green cedar, uh, it's gonna whistle through hardwood. So that's where we're at. And oh, I also forgot the wee bit of history behind the saw. So um, it, the, the earliest known cross-country, cross-cut saw dates to uh, 15th century. And they were a pretty crude thing. They had just pegged teeth. Um, they didn't really come into uh, use, common use, until 1880. And prior to that, they felled trees just with axes. All the cuts were done with axes. And kudos to those guys that wheeled them, because the trees were big. But around 1880, and it sort of started in the Pennsylvania area in the logging industry, and um, they started to be used for not simply bucking, but actually felling the trees. So a couple of things that I still to do, I haven't got oil on my handle, my new handle yet, and I haven't got that hamper, ha uh, helper handle done that would give me a little more force. So before I get cutting cordwood for firewood for next winter, uh, I'm gonna make, either make or find a helper handle for this. So let's see if it cuts. Okay, it's uh, back to the bench. It's actually very sharp. It's cutting quite well, so it's separating the fiber, but like I thought, it d just doesn't have quite enough set. So what's happening, because I don't have enough pitch to the teeth, the blade's binding. Now, it probably would cut hardwood reasonably well, but given I cut both pine, cedar, lots of softwood, I want it to cut both, so we're gonna have to put a little more set in this guy. Anyway, we're gonna leave that today because we got ourselves a lot of snow. And the cabin roof and my chimney, I wanna get the fire going, but my chimney's full. So I gotta clean that and get some off the roof of the cabin because uh, it's getting pretty heavy and warmed right up today, but it's supposed to get freezing cold tonight and that's all gonna freeze up on me. So we're gonna get some of that off. Thank you.